there on out for worship this morning. Sunday school this morning, we had 53 here. Birthdays, any birthday offering? Anybody have a birthday this morning? Oh, uh-huh. 
right. How many of you are awake? Mark, leaves the closet. I'm going. I will too, man. All right. The Bible says in Psalm 145, every day I will bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. For some, it's been a great week. For others, it's been a hard week. If you can't tell, my dad is not here this morning. Um, he's probably watching on Facebook Live, so I'll be nice. He felt and hurt himself this week. And um, they say the third day is the roughest, and today is, in fact, the third day. So pray that he will feel better or that he will go back to the doctor or maybe both. Can you all do that? Hope you came expecting to receive a blessing this morning, not because of us, but because of him. If only one or two people showed up, he'd be in our presence. And everything we do needs to be focused and reflected on him. And I hope and pray that you leave this place closer to him than when you got here. And that if you don't know him as your personal savior, well, guess what? That's what we're talking about today. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you and we're thankful for this opportunity that we have together in your name. Father, to sing praises, Father, to bring our requests before you, and Lord, to fellowship, and most importantly, Father, to break open a portion of your word and to see what it has to say for us. I pray that you'll be with us now, Father, bless our voices as we sing, and then just accept our offering of praise. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. Amen. 
Father, it's so good to be in your house. Lord, like the songwriter said, this world, God, gets harder all the time. And if we let it, it would bring us down. It beat us up. But Father, we're so thankful that we have a hope that this world doesn't have. We have a hope that someday you'll set things right. And that you'll make all things well. And Father, you'll be the judge of all the earth. And as Abraham said, we trust that you'll do what's right. Lord, I thank you so much that you provided a way of salvation. Lord, that you didn't leave us in our sin. That you didn't leave us in this body bound for hell. But God, we're so glad that you provided your son to pay our sin debt. And then, Lord, if we'll just trust him, you'll take us to a home in heaven someday. Lord, we're looking forward to that day. Looking forward to a time whenever we can be in your presence and glory and honor you all the time. Father, but until then, we'll keep singing down here. And we'll keep doing what we can down here to further the gospel. Lord, I pray this morning as Joel does that in a few minutes, as he opens your word, Father, that you'll just give him the message that you have for us today. God, that you'll help him to preach the word that you would have him to. Lord, I pray that people will respond. Father, if there's somebody here who doesn't know you as their God and as their Savior, that the Holy Spirit will draw them to, to Christ today. Just help us, Father, not to be an offense to you. Help us, Father, not to do anything that would hinder you today. We love you so much. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, this morning, very quietly, if you have a youngster, first grade and under, that would like to go to children's worship, Miss Megan's over there now. Y'all can be this. Expecting that, and so what am I going to do? So I took Dad's notes and I took what God told him to preach, and I'm going to preach it because I thought like that's what God wants y'all to hear today. But I was reminded of uh, I think we got the tape from Ed and Vicky when we were a kid. You remember Henry and Doris? Y'all remember the Henry and Doris tape? And oh my goodness, we would listen to that. And Henry and Doris were these people, and they were comedy sketches, okay? But they were kind of poking fun at church people, and sometimes they poked fun at the preacher and. Honestly, they were really poking fun at themselves most of the time, but they just didn't realize it. And in one of them, they were having a nice batch of roast preacher for lunch. Y'all know what I'm talking about whenever I say a batch of roast preacher for lunch? That's where you're talking about to say, boy, he messed up five or six times. For somebody with a college degree, you'd think he could talk a little bit better. Or, my goodness, he talked for so long, I didn't think he was ever going to shut up. Or man, he didn't talk for very long. He must have not prepared that much. I didn't like his shirt. I didn't like his hair. His voice is too high. His voice is too low. Man, people are coming to me for their preacher sons. Anyway, Henry and Doris were talking about the new preacher. All of this to say this. And she said, you know, Henry, I know he reads. I know he reads his entire sermon. He goes, yep, yep. She goes, you know how I knew? You know how I know he reads his sermon? And she goes, yep. She goes, because he lost his place. How did you know he lost his place? Because he went back to the very beginning every time. And she chimes in and goes, three times, three times. I've got three pages of notes. Normally I get up here with one page of notes. If I lose my place, I promise to try to not to go back to the very beginning. All right? But if I do, maybe God wants me to say it twice. I don't know. I once had the privilege of working with Brother Larry Markham, who was probably one of the most gifted people I've ever met with the gift, the spiritual gift of evangelism. 
Larry loved to go knocking on people's doors. Tuesday night was visitation night. Do y'all remember when we did visitation? I think when I was a kid, visitation was on Thursday night. And you would just went around and you visited the people that hadn't been at church in a while. And I, I, I'm not going to debate the uh, the effectiveness of that tool or not. But Larry would pick his subdivision every Tuesday night and just go knocking on doors. The door would open up and he would, before he even said hello, he'd say, Do you know that you know that you know that if you died tonight that you would wake up in the presence of your God and Savior? And 95% of the time he'd get the door slammed in his face. Sometimes they'd curse him out and he'd just smile and turn around and trot to the next doorway and knock on the door and ask the same question over and over and over again. If y'all don't know I'm an extrovert, I'd like to talk to people. I will talk to people at the grocery store. I will talk to, talk to people standing in line for a roller coaster. I'll talk to people I don't know. I'll go on a cruise and make a bunch of friends because I'll just talk to anybody. But for some reason, the thought of going and knocking on somebody's door and asking that question really, really causes me to feel a lot of apprehension. I don't know why. I don't have a problem telling people about Jesus. Man, I love talking about God. Who doesn't, right? I love telling people about Jesus. I love telling people about what he's done for me. But it's something about going and knocking on doors. And whenever Dad shared his notes with me Friday night and I saw the title, I thought, this reminds me of Larry Markham. And so that leads me in to the first point. It's not going to be on the screen. It's just in the notes. And it says, when it comes to eternity, there are only two classes of people in the world, the saved and the lost. There's not any type of a middle ground. I've been associated with a lot of different people over my life and a lot of people that have been involved in different types of faith-based organizations, some of them churches, some of them not. And for a while, I was associated with somebody that had a bunch of family members that were Catholic. I'm not picking on our Catholic friends this morning. I know some Catholics that are saved that have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, but I also want to tell you that praying to the Pope or the Virgin Mary ain't going to do nothing for you. All right? But the, the Catholics have this type of thing where they think there's this weird third dimension that you may or may not go to whenever you die called purgatory. And I guess they think that, you know, they're trying to weigh out your good deeds and your bad deeds. And if you get up there and you don't quite have enough good deeds, that you're going to scatter over to purgatory for a few centuries. And that's why they pray for the dead. They're praying that God will go ahead and take them on into heaven. Let me tell you something. Whenever your heart stops beating, whenever the brain activity ceases on this planet and you cease to exist here, there is no more chance. That's it. The chances end when your life ends. And if that scares you, well, I'm sorry. I don't intend to scare you this morning, but maybe that's what you need. So there are the saved and there is a lost. There's no in between. The Gospel of John, I'm going to read this verse and then we'll get to our regular text. John 20, 31 says, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The Gospel of John was written to tell us how to get saved. I talk to the kids quite often. In fact, last Sunday morning, the Sunday school lesson was about what? Sharing your faith, right? Dustin, you were in there. Were you in there? Advance? I can't remember. But anyway, we talked about sharing your faith. And we talked about how your life has to be an example before you can break up in the book. Because if your life is an example, people aren't going to hear much about what aren't going to want to hear much about what you have to say. But the entire book of John, the gospel, is to tell us how to get saved. And first John is written to tell us how to know that we're saved. There are five basic categories of people with reference to salvation. There are those people who aren't saved and they know it. That may be one of the scariest categories that somebody can be in. You ever been around somebody that knew they weren't saved and just really didn't seem to care too much about it? I've heard him say things like, man, I, you know what? I just want to live my life. I'm going to get all these bad things out of this. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I want to earn, and then at the end of my life, I'll get saved. I hope that works out for you, but it may not. Then there are those that think that, you know what, even if I'm not saved, and I know I'm not saved, then I'm just going to go to hell, and hell's going to be a big old party with all my friends, and we're going to sit in the corner and tell dirty jokes and drink beer. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That's not at all what hell is going to be like. So if you're not saved and you know it, maybe you need to come on down right now and make that right and get saved. But there are those that are, who are, know they aren't saved. There are those who think they are saved but aren't. Y'all, I see so many things as, as, a, as I go through social media. I don't watch the news much anymore, Brother Clark, for the reason that you stated this morning. But as I saw this morning, as Iran started hurling missiles at Israel, let me tell you, the judgment of God is going to fall on the country of Iran and on any country that doesn't support Israel. 
I wasn't going to say it, but here I go. I'm going off script, Kristen. Whenever you go to the ballot box this November, you need to vote for people that are going to support Israel. The Bible says that God will bless the nations that bless Israel and curse the ones that don't. And if you think it's no big deal, I'm here to tell you it is a really, really big deal. But you see all these televangelists on TV, they'll tell you, if you'll send $100 to here, if you'll do this, or if you'll do that, and I'm jumping over some of the stuff we've been talking about on Sunday night. I was watching TV once, I was living in Las Vegas, and I, I, I got home from church, and we didn't have Sunday night church, and so I was watching something, and I kind of, the Trinity Broadcasting Network is what I think it was. That's back whenever I had cable, and man, I had all these channels, and one of them, and there was this big old lady with purple hair. She had humongous purple hair. Her name was Sister Sue, not Miss Sue Cantrell. You don't have purple hair. Purple hair. And if you do, that's your business. But anyway, the sister, she lady was on there, and she read this verse of Scripture, Psalm 68, 19, and it talks about receiving daily benefits from the Lord. And so the sister, Sue lady, on this television program started telling people that if they would mail her a check, this is how long ago it was, mail her a check for $68.19, that they too could receive a daily benefits package from the Lord. You can send $68.19 to Miss Sue all day long. If you don't know Jesus, you ain't going to heaven. You can send $68 million and 100 and I don't know how to make $68.19 work like that. I don't math very well. You can spend every single penny you own and donate it. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. Number three, there are those who think, there are those that we think are saved but aren't. I'm going to stop here and camp out for a few minutes because I know many, many people that have played a game for years and years and years knowing that they weren't saved and acting like they were. It's probably the most dangerous situation you can be in because we know that life is fragile and it can happen just like that. He could call us home. Somebody could serve across the center line. A blood vessel could burst. Something could happen. But I can't say the number of people that have known they weren't saved for a very long time, and we all thought they were, that finally walked an aisle and said, I'm not saved. I need to get saved. And go, wow. Wow. I never would have thought. I thought they were. Probably the most shocking of that one was I remember a night waking up in the middle of the night, and Beetle Bailey was in my house. Why is Beetle Bailey in my house? Not the dog, the real Beetle Bailey over here. <laughs> And my mom had told my dad, I don't think I'm saved. And my dad was so shocked he had to call Beetle to come help. My mom was the preacher's wife, Sunday school teacher, piano player. She had been living a lie. She told me later that she had known since she was baptized when she was 18 years old that she wasn't saved. And she didn't get saved until she was 35. Man, 17 years. And why did she walk that line? Because she was embarrassed. Because she's afraid of what people would say. She was afraid people would think poorly of her. Let me tell you something. If that's where you are this morning, there's not a single person in this room that's going to think anything bad about you. They're just going to be happy. Yeah. Number four. Here we go. I fit into this category all the time. I'm not bragging. I'm just being honest. There are those who are saved but don't act like it. I don't need to camp out there. And then finally, there are people that are saved and... Who live it? Let's read our text. First John chapter five, verses five through thirteen, and it says, "Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth." For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Lord, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I'm going to stop right here and talk for a few minutes. There are people that talk to me all the time, and they say, how on earth can you believe in the Trinity? And there are people that will tell you when you're trying to talk about the Trinity that you're worshiping some weird three-headed God. I'm not worshiping some weird three-headed God. I'm worshiping the God of creation. I'm worshiping the God that created me and that sent his son to die on the cross for my sins. Can I fully explain how he can be three yet one? Absolutely not, but if I could explain it, I probably wouldn't be inclined to worship him. So don't get caught up on that. The Bible says it, and so I believe it. I don't even need to die. There we go. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son, 
He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Verse 13 is the key verse this morning, and it said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. I'm going to try to break this down and explain it as simply as I can, but it comes down to this. People run around all the time and say, well, I just don't know if I'm saved. And you know why I think a lot of people say that and think that? I want you to think back to the night that you got saved or the day that you got saved. And I had a conversation with Mason just a few weeks ago whenever he called me because one of the questions he asked me was, do I have to be at church to get saved? And I said, no, I have a friend that got saved while she was taking a shower. I was, I was not there. She got saved while she was taking a shower. She was standing there. She was washing her hair. And she said it finally occurred to me. She was raised in church. She says, I realized I wasn't saved and I took care of it right then and there. You can get saved wherever you want. But I know that there are people that are caught up on a lot of different things. But I remember the night that I got saved. It was Father's Day, 1984. And um, I was six years old. Um, and I, we went into the office there in the front of the old plot building that was eventually the flower room. And then the building fell in and we had to tear it down. And that was sad. But what a great building we have there in its place. And it's using, it's being used for the community and for our water program and a lot of things. So let's not get caught up on the old plot building. But I recall that there were some things about kids back in that day. Y'all remember whenever kids were seen and not heard? Y'all remember that kids were seen and heard? Now, here was the problem. On Sunday nights after church, we'd typically all end up over going over to somebody's house. And most of the kids would be out playing hide and seek. And hide and seek was okay. But there were two of us out of that crew that always sometimes tried to sneak in and sit at the table and talk to the adults. And that was me and Tim. They would say, you're a kid, go outside. Well, I wanted to be inside where the adults were. I don't know why. But anyway, I liked hide and seek, but I liked being where the adults were. And my dad would tell at the time, boy, that's what he called me, boy, you need to be seen and not heard. And the point of that is this, kids were to be seen and not heard. And after church, we'd stand around out in the parking lot and, and talk and, and just do all those things. And I remember running out to groups of people and running up and interrupting their conversations. Helen, I remember it as plain as day. Running probably between your legs, looking at me going, I got saved. Interrupted you in the middle of a conversation with some other ladies, and you stopped and said, Well, hallelujah, and gave me a big old hug. Kids were to be seen and not heard, but that was one point where I was allowed to be heard. I was excited. I wanted to tell everybody. I think back to the times that I've gotten away from the world. I think about those times at church camp. Whenever you leave and you're so on fire for God that you're ready to charge hell with a water pistol. You know what I'm talking about? You ever known somebody that got so on fire for God that they were irritating to be around? <laughs> By the way, if being around other children of God irritates you because they're so spiritual, that's probably a sign that you're backslidden and need to get on your knees beside your bed or in the altar. But I remember that feeling, and I know that there are times that it ebbs and it flows. But I think the reason a lot of people don't think that they're saved is because they don't have that awesome feeling anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying as I say that? So, life is tough. Life is tough. I remember Mark Lowry saying, he says, whenever I wake up in the morning, I don't feel saved. He says, I don't look saved. And sometimes I have to have a diet Mountain Dew before I feel saved. No, I'm not. So there are some truths in this text. I said all that to say this. Salvation is much more than a feeling. Salvation is much more than just feeling like, oh man, everything in my life is great and so I must be saved. Salvation is much more than a feeling. That wasn't in the notes. Now let's go back to the notes. I promise not to start over. I'm not Henry's preacher. There are three truths in our text that can help us know that we know that we are saved. Number one, the atoning work of Christ. In verse 6, it says, the blood removes the penalty of sin. And Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things by the law are purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. Every once in a while I travel, and whenever I travel I try to go to church. And sometimes I try to go to a VMA church, and every once in a while I try to sneak into just another church to experience something different. I one time was in Washington, D.C. and went to this big, humongo, big old city church. 
and, and, and I'm not going to get political here on this, but the t sermon topic of the day was Black Lives Matter. And I'm sorry, every life matters, but you can't really find that in the Bible. And it was telling us how we, were, how we were all terrible. But she, she gets to the part about, the, the preacher was a woman, and she gets to this part about how people are going to go to heaven. And she says, I think that people are going to go to heaven by the way they treat black people. <laughs> it sounds good. And we ought to treat people right, amen? <coughs> We ought to treat people right that look like us, that don't look like us, that act like us, that don't act like us, and all those things. We ought to treat people right. But I can be the nicest person in the world and I'm still going to die and go to hell. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And you hear these preachers say all the time, well, I'm not going to preach about the blood. Somebody said it just a couple of weeks ago. On Easter Sunday, we're not going to talk about the blood of Christ because it might be offensive to the visitors. I don't care. The water continues to cleanse us from sin. That's sanctification. And I remember as, as, as a young Bible college student, and I've heard a lot of these words in Sunday school and in Galileans. And, and Kevin, I'm really sorry about the way we acted in Galileans sometimes, by the way. Most of it was Jeremy's fault. He's not here to defend himself. But I'm sorry about the way we acted in Galileans. But, but I'll learn some of these words. And I remember thinking that sanctification is a really, really big, long, hard word to understand. And let me tell you, it's not. It's the process of becoming more and more and more like Christ. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. Ephesians 5.26 tells us that we are cleansed with the washing of the water by the word. You see, salvation is something so much more in, in, in practice than just accepting Christ. As your There's nothing more that you have to do, but there should be some changes after the fact. Your life should be a living example of who and what Jesus Christ is. And the fact that he's now living within you should be evidenced by change in your life. And that's the sanctification. The song, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, says this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and the righteousness. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. We know that we can be saved by the abiding witness of the Holy Spirit. We see this in verses 6 through 10. The Holy Spirit takes the atoning work and testifies of it. The Holy Spirit witnesses to you. How many times have you ever been in a situation where things just weren't going right? And you couldn't explain it, but a sense of peace just prevailed and washed over you. And you knew that it had to be a God thing because it certainly wasn't a you thing. I can say that's happened to me many times. Many, many, many times. I think about the people that have recently lost loved ones, and I think then back to the time where I've lost loved ones. And somebody asked me one time, they said, how could you preach Jeremy's funeral? And I said, well, there's a lot of reasons why. Number one, I'm a control freak, and I if it had anybody else done it, they wouldn't have done it the right way. So let's let Joel do it. But it's what I needed to do. It was the most. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was also the most therapeutic thing I could do in that time. And the reason I know I made it through that time and that day especially is because I know that people of God were praying for me and supporting me. And the Holy Spirit led me and guided me and told me what to say. And he can and will do the same thing for you. When you receive Christ as Lord, the Holy Spirit comes into you, and you have the witness in you. I'm going to talk about other religions and faiths here for just a minute, y'all. There's no second blessing that has to happen. You don't get saved, and then after you get baptized, and then have to have some type of an infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not come here this morning to split hairs about speaking in tongues and all of that. If you want to know my opinion on that, I will tell you at a different time. I don't have time to go into this morning. But the Holy Spirit is imparted upon you the moment you receive Christ as your Savior. There's nothing extra that you have to do. All right. Very good. The, Holy, the witness of the Holy Spirit is not an emotional feeling. I've already jumped all over this, but I'm going to talk about it again. Well, the preacher goes to visit somebody at their house, and this guy had been missing church quite a bit, and the preacher didn't say much. They were sitting there, and the guy said, well, preacher, I know why you're here. Let's go out in the backyard. I've got a fire built in the fire pit. And, and they, they sit down by the fire pit, and the preacher didn't say nothing. He just reached out with the tongs, and he took out this ember and set it on the concrete next to the fire pit. And just sat and watched it. Well, what happened after a few minutes? The orange glow that had been coming off of this ember, this piece of whatever that was taken out of the fire, began to cool. And, and as it cooled, the, the, the orange glow left it. 
and eventually it was just sitting there smoking a little bit. And the preacher looked at the guy and he said, you don't have to say nothing, I got it. Y'all, we come to church for a lot of reasons. And some people come to church because it's what's expected. And some people come to church because their mama makes them or because their husband makes them or this, that, or the other. But the reason we ought to come to church is because we want fellowship with God's people and want to learn more about Him. And the longer I'm away from church, the longer I'm away from God's people, the longer I'm away from my daily devotion and my daily Bible reading and my daily prayer, the dimmer my light is, the dimmer my glow is. And the Holy Spirit still abides in us. Spiritual knowledge goes beyond feelings, and the Holy Spirit witnesses through you. I talk to the kids about this a lot. Um, I work in the education system, and, and, and I go around to different conferences and things like that. And I'll have conversations with different educators. And if I find out they work for a school district that I have kids in, and I have kids in quite a few school districts, and the kid that they, they were talking about is no longer in the youth group and has not been in the youth group for a very long time, so don't try to figure out who this was. But I was having a conversation with somebody one time that worked at a school, and I said, oh, well, do you know so-and-so? They're a member of my youth group. And that person looked at me and said, so-and-so goes to church? <laughs> You wouldn't know it by the way they act. It's kind of sad, isn't it? If your life was the only Bible that somebody had ever read, what kind of a story would it tell about the Son of God? What kind of a story would it tell? We have the affirming word of the Father. God gave us an eternal record, the Bible. And we learn about everything we need to know. Y'all, the more I read the Bible, the more questions I have. The more answers I get, but the more questions I have because there's so much there that to steal an education term needs to be unpacked. But I've said everything I've said this morning to tell you this thing. You can know Amen. that you know that you know that you're going to go to heaven. Amen. I don't think there's a person in this room that's been saved for any extended period of time that has never had an experience where they doubted their salvation. You ever doubted your salvation? I know I have. Probably one of the last times I doubted, and it was less of a doubt and more of a thing, but whenever I had my gallbladder out in, in 2020, and I, I don't recommend having surgery in the middle of a global pandemic because if they mess it up and you go to the hospital, nobody can come visit you, so you're kind of stuck in the hospital there all by yourself. And, yeah, I, I had the gallbladder removed. I, I got cleared by the doctor. He said everything was great. I got on an airplane. I went on vacation. Um, I rented a convertible. I went to the beach. I got sunburned. And while I was sunburned, I didn't realize that I was starting to get jaundiced. Okay? I came home. I walked into church. Megan Bay looked at me. She goes, are you still? You're not tan. You're yellow. She says, look at your eyes. She said, she said your eyes are brown. This is not a good thing. You need to go see your doctor. Several other people told me that day, boy, you just don't look good. I know that people were trying to be nice, but that's not a fun thing to hear. Boy, you just don't look good, okay? <laughs> I walked into my doctor's office on Tuesday. He walked in. He took one look at me. didn't say a word. He turned on his heel, walked over to the phone, called Washington Regional, and said, I have a direct admin. And for the next three days, four days and three nights, I was in the hospital. Tuesday night. They put me on NPO, so at this point I hadn't eaten anything since lunch on Monday because they were going to do surgery. They did surgery on Wednesday morning. It didn't work. They did surgery again on Wednesday at noon. It didn't work. The doctor came in Wednesday evening and said, Mr. Young, do you have your will written out? I said, I don't have a will written out. Why do I need one of those? And he said, if the surgery doesn't work tonight, it's likely that you're not going to make it. Have a good day. He turned around and walked out. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. You have a great day, too. <laughs> Couldn't be cussing out. You know, it was pretty true. As I laid there in bed looking at the ceiling, because I couldn't roll over because there were too many tubes attached, I started praying. And I prayed for my dad, and I prayed for my mom, and I prayed for my sister. I prayed for a lot of people. I prayed for y'all. I prayed for this church, and then finally I said, Lord, I know for sure I meant it when I was six years old, but if, if I didn't say it right, if I messed anything up, I just want to make sure I'm saved. I'm not making light of that moment. But in that moment, whenever I was faced with the fact that my life might end within 24 hours, I wanted to be sure. 
I thought I knew him. I'm still sure. Does that mean my life's perfect? No, if I'm, if I'm building my insurance and my faith on that, man, it, 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 it's messed up. Do I always live it? Absolutely not. But do I know that at the end of the day, whenever I was six years old, I surrendered my heart and my life to Jesus Christ? Yes. And you can know too. Brother Clark, can I request that we sing nothing but the blood of Jesus? We're going to stand in a moment. We're going to sing. We're going to have a few moments of invitation. And y'all, I don't know how you need to respond to this invitation this morning, so I'm going to throw out a few options. There are some people here that know somebody that's not saved. And you need to come down here and get down on your knees and pray for that person. I want to tell you, and I, I don't say this to be, to be glib or anything like that, but I've got people in my life that I've been praying for for a very, very long time. And honestly, I've gotten to the point that I'm kind of sick of praying the same prayer over and over. But God's not sick of hearing my prayer. And he's not sick of hearing your prayer. Maybe you've got somebody or something you need to pray for. Maybe you've been a church member for a hundred years. Maybe you've been baptized so many times that you just, man, your hair's still wet from the last time. But you know deep down you're not saved. Come down and take care of that today. I'm going to ask our Christian brothers and sisters to also come down to make it easier for those that might need to make a move. However, God leads you this morning, you respond. Let's stand. Jay Norton, give us some prayers we begin this time of invitation.
Garland's pink, lead us in prayer. Take this off. 